the time, and so we want to get started. I'm Linda Andrews, and I'm the uh, county chair. And um, I have to apologize on the behalf of the legislature. Can you hear me? It'd be nice to have a little louder. How about that? That work? Yeah. Okay. I'll have to work for Liam. It'll be. Okay. Okay. I think you can all hear me. Can you all hear me anyway? Yes. <laughs> Okay, and um, I want to apologize for the legislators. All the House have a special meeting at 5 o'clock in Montpelier today. That would be House seven o'clock meeting. And Chris Grayson, his apologies because he has a Senate meeting. And they're in the last section of this 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 uh, session. So um, they, so we won't see anybody. We might see Ruth. She hasn't, I haven't heard from her, but the rest of the day. So welcome all. And um, I want to turn the meeting over to... Um, Dave Silverman, who'll he'll be the moderator and introduce the speaker. So, great. Thank you, Linda. Uh, so for those of you who don't know me in uh, on Middleware Community TV, uh, my name is Dave Silverman. I'm the uh, High Bailiff of Addison County and also the uh, Vice Chair of the Addison County Democratic Committee. Um, and uh, with me today, uh, our distinguished panel consists of Ian Sullivan, the uh, State's Attorney from Rutland County, uh, a quick bio, Ian was first elected state's attorney in 2022. Uh, he graduated from Mount Law School in 2013 uh, and has served as a prosecutor for Rutland County since 2014, uh, rising through the ranks from deputy state's attorney to chief deputy state's attorney to acting state's attorney before taking a good office. A lifelong Vermonter, Ian grew up in Jericho and currently lives in Pittsfield with his wife, two children, and one goofy, I'm told, Australian shepherd. Um, next to Ian is Danielle Wallace, the Executive Director of Turning Point Center here in Middlebury. Uh, Danielle has served as the ED of the Turning Point Center of Addison County since June of 22. Uh, she has been in recovery from, sub from substance use disorder for the past nine years. Danielle completed her bachelor's in mental health and human services with an addiction focus through the University of Maine and Augusta and participated in Vermont Law School's 2018 inaugural Masters of Art in Restorative Justice. She works for Addison County's Restorative Justice Services Court Diversion Program. She worked for the uh, Court Diversion Program from 2018 to 2022. And when she is not working, Danielle is kept very busy raising her wonderful daughter, Savannah. And next to Danielle is my friend David Mickenberg, a partner at Mickenberg, Dunn and Smith in Burlington. Um, and uh, Dave has been actively involved in drug policy reform since 1997. He started his career at the Drug Policy Alliance, the nation's foremost drug uh, reform advocacy group, uh, where he worked on political efforts to reduce the harms associated with the war on drugs, including a multi-year effort to allow Vermonters to access methadone treatment. He currently works on a variety of public policy campaigns, including an effort to decriminalize drugs in favor of a public health approach a push to decriminalize sex work, legislation to increase the rights of working Vermonters, and efforts to increase benefits and protections for older Vermonters. David played an active role in the establishment of Vermont's medical cannabis program, legislation to decriminalize cannabis, legislation to legalize home grow, possession of cannabis, and expungement of previous cannabis convictions, and ultimately legislation to establish a regulated system for cannabis sales. So welcome panel, thank you for coming. I'm going to kick off by inviting Ian to speak with us about uh, the program that he's created in Rutland County. Uh, Ian, take it away. Hi, I'm Ian. Um, I'll just start by talking about what a state's attorney is because we use a different term than many, many other jurisdictions. And I'm going to screw up the audio feed. Sorry about that. <clears throat> so in Vermont, state's attorney is the elected prosecutor for the county. Um, so for me, it's Rutland County. Um, very happy to talk to all of you, but I'm not your state's attorney. Um, we are kind of the, the first line prosecutors for any crime that happens within, uh, within our county boundaries, whether that is the theft of a six pack, up to sexual assault, and even homicides. It's us. Of course, uh, there's overlapping jurisdiction on some issues with uh, the U.S. Attorney's Office and uh, the Attorney General's Office has concurrent jurisdiction with the state's attorneys. Within that space, we 
we really get one directive from our one and only client, which is the people of Vermont. And that is to do the right thing to the best of our lights. Now, you ask any group of people, what's the right thing? And you're going to get different answers. The discussions about what the right thing is and how we approach some of the most pressing problems of our communities is intellectually pretty exciting. And I think it's a moral imperative for all of us in a democratic society. So, assuming my technology works, I'm really planning on covering three things when I talk to you about Rutland County's treatment court. First, that from my perspective, there is a pressing need for new solutions and to lean into the solutions that are showing some sort of promise. Next, treatment court in a nutshell, and then, uh, time permitting, I'm going to try to get into some of the nuts and bolts of how the treatment court works. So first, the pressing need for a response. So hey, I, I'm not really going to talk politics, but I suspect in a room full of Addison County Democrats, this headline and that man are not a surprise to any of you, right? Back in 2014, in the January state, state address, Governor Shumlin, in an uncharacteristic move for Vermont governors, devoted his entire state of the state address to the opiate crisis. Everyone remembers that? Yes? Yes, everyone remembers that. So, so yes. So, 2014, Vermont Department of Health also collecting data. This is from their most recent opiate report from February of 2024. So, there are lag times sending out blood for toxicological assessment, comparing that to the actual physical autopsy reports takes time. But odds are good when Governor Shumlin spoke, he was talking about either the 2020, pardon me, 2012 number of 50 opiate related deaths in a year or 2013 for 69. When Governor Shumlin was talking, we were facing a crisis, but what I think Nobody could have forecasted was just how bad things would get. And they got worse and worse. And whether, depending on which year we're talking about, either in the range of four or five times as many opiate related deaths in 2022 as the period Governor Shumlin was talking about. I think for many of us today, 10 years ago, it is a lot harder to identify these deaths as an other, as somebody that we don't know. There are very few families, very few people I talk to that have gone untouched by these deaths. Maybe there was a time when people could say, this is somebody else's problem, I don't need to worry about it. I wish no one would ever say that. But certainly our experiences over the last few decades leave with very few people able to say that and able to say that honestly. Vermont's Department of Health, despite being a small state, does keep information about the composition of um, some of the constituent drugs that are mixed with opioid-related drugs. So fentanyl is one we hear a lot about. The drugs we hear less about that or at least associated with this, the continued rise in opiate-related overdoses, or xylazine. Uh, I'm married to a veterinarian. That's one of the few reasons I can pronounce that word. Uh, it's a horse, it is frequently used in horse tranquilizers, the gabapentin. For reasons that I can't fully explain, those drugs have made an increasing appearance in the drug supply in Vermont. You can see the numbers from 2023 from uh, the reported overdose deaths and the presence of xylazine and gabapentin in that drug supply. <clears throat> now, I will step back into my Rutland hat. Uh, you can see this is the Department of Health's uh, graphical representation of the rate of overdose deaths per 100,000 across the state. Uh, Rutland. Wyndham County and Bennington County, all over 50 per 100,000 residents. Obviously, 
Uh, one of those counties has a hundred thousand, but it's getting us to speaking in similar units. Um, fortunately for all of you in Addison County, the scope of the problem is not as many people, but it is still very real and pressing. I submit to all of you a very real and pressing problem in all of the bonds communities. So, treatment court in a nutshell. I think in order for me to meaningfully talk about what treatment court is, I have to contrast it to the criminal justice system without treatment court. <clears throat> so now, I came up with a graphic. My wife said it might not be the most organized graphic in the world, but I promise you I spent spent for the Sunday doing it, so hopefully it will aid in some understanding. Um, so this is, roughly speaking, the flow chart of how cases get through the criminal justice system, starting up here on the left, an incident, there's an investigation and possibly an arrest or citation by the police. That's when my office gets involved, when the state's attorney's office gets involved, Case intake and charging decision is kind of where we become involved. In Vermont, for a long time, relatively speaking, has had an alternative justice uh, program, which I'm very glad to hear that somebody from Addison County Court Diversion is here, because for expungement eligible offenses, so some of the lowest level misdemeanors, including misdemeanor possession of basically any regulated drug under Vermont law, there is a statutory presumption to go down the alternative justice route where folks are referred either through diversion or tamarack to the uh, alternative justice center. Court diversion is what ours is called, it sounds like the same in Addison County. If someone is successful, they get to the complete stage, the case is dismissed, um, Vermont's automatic expungement statute will kick in. After a period of time, all court record will be erased. If, however, the person does not, complete the alternative justice step, we bounce back to the court track. For cases, for charges that are not expungement, presumptive expungement eligible, a prosecutor can still refer it to diversion or tamarack in the alternative justice world, or they can direct the case through the court track. There's a possibility of all sorts of litigation and a trial, but ultimately some form of an adjudication, either a conviction or a dismissal. Once there is an adjudication, there are sentencing options. The broad, broad categories are a fine, money, probation, a suspended sentence supervised by the Department of Corrections in the community, or of course, the thing that everybody thinks of when we talk about criminal justice, jail, right? In the custody of the Department of Corrections. Now let's see how good my graphic skills are. Ugh, it's even weird. Um, I had to leave out the alternative justice part because uh, I'd already used a lot of states. But same thing, incident, investigation, and then we get to case intake and charging decision. For not, not low level, not misdemeanor possession charges, but for weightier uh, offenses that have a component where the criminal conduct may be driven by substance use disorder. A prosecutor in a county that has a treatment court can decide, in addition to filing the case in the court track, to make a referral for screening to the treatment court, assuming the person is interested and is high risk, high needs. They can work out a referral agreement between the defense and the prosecution then this is going to get us to a uh, contingent, a contingent adjudication for that person. It's contingent upon their participation and performance in the treatment court. This is over to our treatment court participation. If they do not participate, if they are not engaged in the process, they would return to criminal court for a traditional sentencing uh, along the lines of the things we talked about. Uh, if, however, they are successful and they get all the way through treatment court, graduate from treatment court, they generally 
because these are contingent agreements that are worked out in the same generally, generally get a very short period of supervision on either a reduced charge or outright dismissal of the charges. So there is a very heavy incentive from a criminal record and jail sentence responds to engage in the treatment court and be successful. So hopefully my flowchart mostly worked there. Uh, so getting into what treatment courts are. The mission statement of Vermont's treatment courts is that we work collaboratively with community stakeholders to break the cycle of substance use disorder and crime by our partnering in evidence-based treatment with intensive judicial oversight. Our goals are reducing criminal behavior driven by substance use and behavioral health disorders, enhancing community safety, reducing substance dependence, reducing the impact of drug-related cases on criminal justice resources, and to support treatment court participants to become healthy, productive members of the community. Some key factors into what goes into a treatment court referral case. This is a jail diversion program. It is not designed at, for people with the lowest level possessions, cases that are presumptively going through alternative justice. It is not designed for cases that would go to probation. It is a jail diversion program. It is also a voluntary program. Nobody has to do this. It is not a sentencing option. When the person participates in a screening with the treatment court coordinator, very clear. This is a voluntary program. In many ways, this is the highest form of community supervision. It is far more onerous than being on probation. It only works for the person and for the community if they want to be there, if they want to engage in this program. The treatment court, day to day, week to week, um, for lack of a more elegant term, takes a care and sick approach. If the person is successful to get to graduation, there is no jail time. There's either dismissal or reduction of charges. If they are not successful, a traditional jail sentence is imposed. Treatment courts try to follow best practices. They aim for target populations. They try to make sure that historically disadvantaged groups are given the opportunity to participate and succeed in the program. There are defined roles and responsibilities for all of the stakeholders within the system. And there are incentives, sanctions, and therapeutic adjustments. I promise I will talk more about that later. The idea is that we are engaging complementary treatment and social services through the caseworkers and the treatment court coordinator. That while we are engaging with the people, we are also engaging with the verification process through drug and alcohol testing on a regular basis. Those roles and responsibilities I talked about are brought to bear through a multidisciplinary team. So again, our target population. I used this phrase once before, but we are talking about high risk, high need. High risk of reoffending and high need in terms of the intensity of their substance use disorder. In the screening that I talked about is kind of that intake gatekeeper. They employ uh, an evidence-based tool adopted by the judiciary to assess whether someone is in fact high risk or high need. The idea is we are trying to scrub free of the process our subjective beliefs and feelings about who should be in the program, who gets a chance. Additionally, we want to make sure that we are not mixing risk levels. If we are, we do not want to bring somebody in who is low risk, low need, and have them form a peer group with people who have higher risks and higher needs. In many ways, this model, incentives, sanctions, and therapeutic <coughs> adjustments, is the hard day in, day out work of making the treatment court work. Incentives are designed to occur frequently for positive behaviors and come directly from a judge. 
when people show up in court every other week to engage in treatment court, they are being incentivized for positive behaviors from a judge in the black robe on the bench. There are also sanctions for negative behaviors. And those sanctions, because the person has entered into the treatment court, can happen quickly. Part of agreeing to be in treatment court is agreeing to subject themselves to more summary forms of sanctions rather than the full criminal justice process where a new crime, as opposed to a violation of the treatment court rules and responsibilities, a person enjoys a right to a jury trial and proof by beyond a reasonable doubt. So this allows for more quick interventions on things that do not rise to the level of criminal behavior. Now, those two things, that would be that carrot and stick, that phrase we all know about. But from my perspective, this third thing, the therapeutic adjustment, is really where some of the most important work of the treatment court happens, because it is how we change the, the treatment response. Whether somebody's going to inpatient treatment, whether they're doing intensive outpatient, whether they're doing group meetings. The idea is we are tailoring the treatment response to the person's need. For somebody who just enters treatment court, who is really, in many ways, at the peak of the challenges posed by their substance use disorder, making a therapeutic adjustment <coughs> based on continued use is entirely the right response, not, not ordering somebody to do community service as a sanction. As they progress through the program and experience success, a sanction may be appropriate for a relapse, as well as a therapeutic adjustment, because as someone progresses, so too do the program's expectations. Uh, I'm falling prey to the shortcoming of all lawyers, so if I tell me when I'm running over and I can wrap it up. Oh, getting there. Getting there, okay, cool, faster. Uh, We try very hard to have a continuum of care available to all of our participants from the most community-based treatment responses with their case managers, and group meetings, all the way up to residential treatment. Just about everybody who is in the program is using medication-assisted treatment. Certainly, I, I am not a doctor, I'm not a doctor, but I get to talk to doctors sometimes. And my understanding, as well as the treatment court, coordinators is that medication-assisted treatment is the evidence-based best response to folks suffering from substance use disorder. Uh, like I said, we have case managers who work within the system, and they are not only connecting people with recovery resources, but also social services to address the consolation of problems that they face so that people can build a durable recovery. I'm going to move quickly before I get yanked. <laughs> um, drug and alcohol testing. Like I said, we work with the people, but we also want to verify that the progress that is being reported is showing up in, in the testing. So regular and randomized drug and alcohol testing is how we verify people's progress. One of the ways it is not just a prosecutor. These programs only work with buying from the judiciary, from the, the defense attorneys, and from community stakeholders, because each person has a role in creating a community of recovery for treatment court participants. That multidisciplinary team uh, is a regular contact but meets every other week before the public hearing where the participants show up and speak with the judge. Lots of people in there. Uh, nuts and bolts. This is where I'm going to move really fast before I begin. Good. The program in Rutland has five phases. Progression from one phase to the second to the third and so on through graduation it requires cleaning time, meeting goals, and a request to advance. At minimum, this is a 14-month program. Our average is around 20 months for the people who do graduate. Weekly, 
Folks are developing treatment plans, random drug screens, case management, and treatment plan. I'm going to move to the, our status hearings. Like I said, this is in front of a judge. For those of you who have not walked into a courtroom, it almost always is designed to give people a sense of the moment they're at. This is a serious thing. It is also designed to make the judge appear to be a person of authority, which they are. No lawyer. Of course I'm going to say the judge is a person of authority. But some of the magic of this program, from my perspective, comes from community members in a position of authority expressing interest and concern and a desire that people are able to achieve their goals. That happens from the judge, happens from prosecutors, and those are people who are historically in adversarial roles at least on some level, to the people who come before a criminal court. It may well be that for some of these people, this will be the first time that they experience people in a position of authority really cheering for their success. And in a lot of ways, that can help people change their lives. I'm going to skip to the fun part, the graduation part. When people get to the end of their treatment court, photo credit, Robin Harrell, uh, there is a graduation ceremony where not only do the participants of the treatment court, members of the community get invited to attend and celebrate the accomplishments that someone has made to get their life back. It is, I, I find high school and college graduations a little boring, one of the most moving things I think you can see. Frequently, you will see family members who, for their own protection or because they are trying to help, have at some point cut themselves off from the participant who have found a way back to the person they love and vice versa. I'm going to close with two parting thoughts. The first is we are talking about crimes driven by substance use disorder. That is the targeted population the treatment courts are supposed to hit. In the traditional criminal justice system, somebody commits a burglary into a home, they might go to jail for quite a while. I think folks in just about any community in Vermont have heard a story of somebody whose son or daughter or granddaughter or grandson has broken into their home, stolen some family jewelry, something valuable, to sell it to get drugs. I've certainly heard that story more times than I care to count. And for that parent or grandparent, when they call the police, by and large, I'm not saying everybody, but by and large, what they want is to get their child back, get their grandchild back. And if we put that person in jail, if they leave jail and they are still driven by their substance use disorder, odds are good we're going to see them again. So all we have achieved is a period of incapacitation if, if through engagement with our treatment courts, the person achieves a lasting and durable sobriety. That's a powerful public safety, that is a powerful public safety outcome that we do not achieve with nearly the same regularity in the traditional criminal justice system. And then my final thought, which I made sure to write down for myself, because one of the um, sanctions that our treatment court judge regularly uses is asking a person to do a brief essay or sound recording, because, or sound recording about what they want out of treatment court. And one young man responded in his essay, I want my life. And then in our next treatment court session, in front of his peers in the treatment court, the judge asked him to engage in a conversation about that, and he did. And in this room full of people who have lived hard lives and faced some pretty serious consequences in front of the criminal justice system, I saw people nodding and engaged because it was a shared vision. It is my hope that building communities in recovery through our treatment court, that we start to reverse 
some of that awful and grim trend that I started with. Um, and I have grossly monopolized other people's time, and I apologize for that. Thank you. Thank you. We'll definitely have lots of questions uh, from myself and, and from the audience as well. But Ian, um, you'll take a seat, and I'll go over here, because we only have two microphones. And I'm going to turn it over now to Danielle Wallace from the Turning Point Center here in Middlebury. And I kind of see this shift as a, you know, let's zoom in, sure. um, you know, from Rutland County, kind of giving us a, a view of what's going on nearby. What's happening here? I'd, lo I'd love for you to tell me a little bit about the services that your organization provides, what you're seeing on the ground here, both in terms of, um, you know, the what does the problem look like now, and kind of where is the shifting happening? Uh, and what do you see as the um, systemic roadblocks that are getting in the way of people achieving recovery? Sure. So um, uh, we are a peer recovery center. Uh, there's a turning point center in um, nearly every county in Vermont. Um, and so what we offer is people with lived experience. Uh, so I'm actually a graduate of treatment program um in maine um uh so i totally can see that um and feel that um, uh magic that happens with the judge uh and that's what makes our services work is that um a lot of people we work or that work for the center have that experience and can see that insanity that our um, participants are going through um, and allow them to find their way out. Um, so we don't require anything. There is a requirement or consequence for struggling, um, for relapse, um, and there is no judgment. Uh, so we're a place where we offer group support or individual support, and then uh, family support as well, which when we see those numbers and think about how many families have lost loved ones um, and how many lives that's touched. It's so important to have that support available. Um, I moved to Vermont uh, in 2016. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that opiate epidemic has been going on for, um, you know, decades. Um, and I've lost count of the people that I know that aren't here anymore. Um, and I, saw that continue from where I live and when I came here, we're seeing the same uh, kind of uh, tragedies that are occurring. This last year or the last, actually since COVID, we are starting to see a shift from uh, opiate use to a combination of opiate use and stimulant use. Um, and also seeing the consequences of stimulant use and they are very different than opiate use. Uh, I think Middlebury saw that um, this, uh, summer pretty significantly um, when people are up for a long time um, and just the way stimulants work on your brain uh, and also that. Sorry, Danielle, can I just, just ask sure. you to clarify when you say stimulants? Um, sorry. Yeah. Yes, sorry, cocaine, methamphetamine um, use is what we're seeing start to increase. Um, I think it happens, uh, also we see that in connection with MIT at times where a person's on medication assisted treatment um, for opiates um, so that opiates don't work the same as they would if that um, buprenorphine wasn't there. Um, so then there's a the use of stimulants which can still um, uh, cause a person to be intoxicated. intoxicated. And there's also not medicated assistance treatment for stimulants, um, so there's less options. Uh, there's less ability for people to get that support. Um, and I think what we see in this county is that um, because the numbers are smaller, um, sometimes it doesn't have as much of an impact, so there are not the supports available. Uh, we don't have treatment court. We have the option to uh, send people to the Chittenden treatment court, which uh, we're dealing with a population that typically doesn't have transportation. Um, so we're asking them to uh, commit to something that's nearly impossible because uh, our uh, bus system is really, uh, essentially people are up in Burlington all day. When their appointments are done, they're just kind of there hanging out waiting for the next bus. 
Um, so we don't have that ability for people to get that support. We also don't have any uh, intensive outpatient programming for people that are struggling. Um, CSAC has, is really our go-to option for substance use and typically our people are met with a uh, long waiting list uh, of months at times to even get assessed to see where they may fit within the, you know, whether it's what kind of treatment they can uh, or that they recommend. Uh, we still see alcohol as a huge issue in this county. <clears throat> we go into the emergency department, uh, meet with people when they're in crisis. That's usually a really important decision-making time for people. Um, so we're, um, but we're still seeing alcoholism on a pretty significant level. Uh, and as usually about two thirds of the people that we see in those emergent situations is there for alcohol use. <clears throat> and that is all over the spectrum, whether it's young people up to our, old, our aging population. Um, and then uh, the big issue, I guess, uh, just end with the barrier of transportation isn't just for treatment court. Um, it's just, it is also for going to a meeting, getting to coaching sessions. Um, because once you've lost your license, the systems to get it back are incredibly difficult to manage, um, especially after a DUI charge. Um, I actually teach the IDRP, which is Impaired Drivers Rehabilitation Course, um, for Carter, Vermont, an agency out of Stowe, apart from my role at, at um, the Turning Point Center. Uh, and it's $400 to take the course, which for some of the people that I work with, that's maybe a million. Uh, there isn't any programs out there to help people with that. Um, so there isn't a scholarship or any way, uh, and there is no sunset provision. Um, so sometimes I'm working with someone that had a DUI one 10 years ago, and they've been sober for eight of it, but they can't get their license back because they can't come up with $400. Um, so it's just that cycle that it keeps going. Um, and then there's that snowball effect where people drive because they have to get to work. Uh, and then they get pulled over and we see fines. Um, and then it just further complicates their uh, ability to get the supports they need. I think we have a lot of great uh, um, electronic virtual options. We're also dealing with a population that struggles with that pretty significantly. Um, the ability to use technology to be able to get onto a Zoom meeting. Um, and it's just not the same. Uh, that in-person, one-on-one support um, is different. Uh, and the ability to get to in-person in -person meetings is also different. Um, so I think the rural um, landscape of this county makes it really difficult for people to get the support they need. Wow. Um, so you mentioned, um, you know, CSAC the counseling services, and I, I, I would love to just sort of understand a little better how you and your organization and CSAC sort of, I mean, for lack of a better word, divvy up the work. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you work together? Who does, like, sure. how, does the, how do those responsibilities fall? Yeah, I think sometimes our systems are really siloed in Addison County, so, um, uh, we have gotten a lot better about partnering. Um, CSAC is that more licensed support. Um, so if somebody is doing an assessment, typically for a court program or um, um, maybe for their probation officer, um, they would need to go through CSAC to get that license assessment to determine diagnosis as well as what the um, treatment plan is gonna be. So we're not um, qualified for that. Um, they're the experts, uh, we're the peer support, so we're not experts, we're just there to walk with people as they figure out what their goals are, um, and we use motivational interviewing, which is evidence-based, to help people figure that out. Um, and also, if they're depending, and I think this is where things get always get confusing, is, is it substance-driven or is it mental health-driven? Um, and then who really needs to take on that. Uh, and they often are in, together and there's often both issues going on. Um, uh, so at times CSAC will refer to us when they don't have, so, when they don't have 
uh, ability to see somebody for a few months so they can work with a peer in the meantime. Um, and then afterwards, just that collaboration to help people get um, the, whatever they need and any other resources that are um, needed to be for. Um, how many people do you serve in a given month, let's say? Ballpark. Ballpark. We have, so for meetings, it's a different number. Um, we have a lot of people coming in and out of our doors for group meetings. Um, but if we think of unique individuals, we serve about 40 um, at any given time. Usually they're long-term relationships. Um, so I have some coaches, our coaches that are working with people they've been working with for years. Um, but typically about 40 or 50. There's a lot of people we're missing. Um, we're noticing that our members really drop off outside of Middlebury. Again, bringing it back to that transportation as well as um, marketing the supports that we have, um, just so that people know they're out there. Uh, so we're really working on how we can get to people instead of requiring them to get to us. Um, and are hoping to secure funding so that we can do more of a outreach um, similar to home health model so that we can actually do coaching at people's houses um, because we do see significant drop off outside of Middlebury. I think 75% of the people we're seeing are from Middlebury specifically. Right. And, and that makes sense with the transportation issues. You know, we're just thinking about Addison County, you know, roughly 40,000 residents, about 10,000 of them here in Middlebury, mm -hmm. right? And to get to you where you are, you're not, you're not exactly downtown. Nope. So, you know, if you're coming in from Bristol or Virgins, it's two buses, yes. right? Um, so that, that's an interesting uh, conundrum. Yes. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, and and tell me a little bit about your about your funding. Um, is it uh, mostly private grants? Uh, what are we looking at? So mostly state funds. Um, the states uh, the center started based on state grants. Um, uh, and we have an infrastructure grant that um, yearly that the legislature funds. Um, uh, and then um, some funding is uh, filtered through SAMHSA through the state. Uh, and then we also are always fundraising development um, uh, to uh, whether it's through appeals um, or um, foundations, private grants. Um, so it's always a cycle of what is available. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just uh, mindful of the time, I'm, I'm going to move on to, uh, to David and then we'll, um, again, we'll circle back for questions. So if you wouldn't mind just passing the microphone down just a little bit further. Um, David, thanks for coming down. Seem to be really picking up. I'm sorry? I don't think your microphone is picking up. Oh, I need to talk closer to my microphone. I, well, I think so. Okay. I mean, I can hear So David. Um, not easy. David, I'd like to zoom back out a little bit with you, and I'd love for you to start by telling us a little bit about what recent changes uh, Vermont's legislature has made in response, you know, since, uh, say, 2014, right, when we uh, started to at least pretend to take this problem seriously. Uh, and then um, also tell me, tell us, what it is that you are working on, sort of uh, future pace, and kind of what are the, what's DPA, Drug Policy Alliance, you know, kind of pushing for nationally, that sort of stuff. Okay, thank you. Um, just to orient you to my perspective, uh, I'm an attorney, I've been working in drug policy for almost 30 years now. Um, and I take the approach that um, what's commonly known as the war on drugs and the laws that have come out of the war on drugs have actually caused more harm than good. Um, and that um, we should be looking at drugs, drug use, drug abuse, uh, substance use disorder through a public health approach um, and an evidence-based public health approach. Um, for many years, that perspective has uh, been considered sort of, I don't know, radical is the word, but not the mainstream. But I'm heartened that now, both in Vermont and nationally, uh, just last year, uh, Dr. Nora Balco, the head of the National Institutes on Drug Abuse, uh, sort of reaffirmed the idea that um, that 
looking at substance use disorder through a carceral lens, through putting people in prison, uh, is not the approach that's most effective um, from a public health perspective. And so I think that conversation, things like treatment core, uh, other types of programs have come out of a desire to reform. And Vermont at times has been at the leading edge of that reform. Um, and at other times has been behind the time. When I started this work in Vermont in 2000, um, we had no needle exchange or uh, syringe exchange, no methadone treatment, no buprenorphine treatment, no naloxone, no hub and spoke model, no treatment in prison, no contingency management, which I think was something that was mentioned. Contingency management is something that we should all be thinking and, and talking about is the leading way of treating folks with stimulant uh, addiction and contingency management in sort of layperson terms is paying people not to continue to use. Sounds radical and as a concept, but if it works, why wouldn't we do it? And I think we are doing it here in Vermont and I'm, and I'm proud of that. Um, we had no good Samaritan law where you can call 911 and not be prosecuted to prevent an overdose. None of the things that we have um, on our books now and we take for granted as things that are helpful in the process of preventing unnecessary deaths um, were there and it took time and effort and the work of folks here and others uh, to put that into place. So we are continuing to do that in different areas to address some of the concerns that were brought up here today. And Ian's slide about um, the, uh, the overdose deaths is always, every time I see that I'm just like, really, it's really hard to imagine. Um, I sort of contrast that and we bifurcate drugs. Um, certain drugs are okay, other drugs are bad. In the state of Vermont, the leading cause of death and disease is tobacco. There was 960 people that died uh, in 2023 from tobacco deaths. The idea that we would now criminalize tobacco, say you got to go to jail and if you are good and they're quit tobacco, we won't send you to jail. I mean, we're not having that conversation. Alcohol, the same thing. Um, in 2021, there was 446 alcohol-related deaths. Um, between 2017 and 2021, uh, the deaths related to alcohol between for folks that are 35 to 49 were up 59%. Um, adults, actually, this was surprising, over the age of 65 have the highest rate of deaths in Vermont, uh, alcohol-related deaths. And uh, one in four deaths in Vermont uh, for folks age 20 to 34 alcohol related. I just bring those to the to the floor to say we're not having a conversation in Vermont about criminalizing alcohol and tobacco. Um, and so I just wanted to provide that as some context because to me it really clarifies that the perspective that I think and I think a growing group of Vermonters think. Uh, that we should take is a public health evidence-based approach that actually saves people's lives, helps communities, lowers all of the bad things that we want and increases all of the good things. So to that end, to your question, Dave, what have we been doing recently to that effect? Uh, one of the initiatives um, that happened a couple of years ago was uh, the idea of uh, waiting lists and for treatment was brought up and people can't access treatment. So there was an effort in the legislature to decriminalize the possession of a certain amount of buprenorphine. Um, that was controversial. Uh, it was, I believe, vetoed by the governor once, maybe, um, but certainly opposed. Um, and ultimately it was passed. Um, and oftentimes when we pass these things, we heard the same thing when we passed methadone. Governor Dean was a fierce opponent of it. We had to get veto-proof majorities in both houses. Same thing for needles, all of them we hear all these bad things are gonna happen. So we heard the same thing with buprenorphine decriminalization. In fact, they insisted on having a study to evaluate the program and sunset um, the, the uh, decrim. The study came back, none of those bad things happened. Um, and last year we made it permanently the decriminalization of buprenorphine so that people who are waiting, who cannot access treatment programs are able to get it. Um, and coupled with that, Last year, we passed um, a bill first in the country that would allow anyone, all of us in this room, anyone to bring their drugs into um, a program uh, that we set up all over Vermont and to have their drugs tested. 
not just for the presence of xylazine or fentanyl or gabapentin, but for the amounts, uh, so that people really know uh, what is in their drugs prior to taking them, to give them and, frankly, the community the awareness as to whether or not there is a bad batch of, of drugs that are out there and um, spread that information as a public health approach to make sure that people uh, aren't taking too much of something that could lead to their death um, or, or something that they just shouldn't be taking at all. Um, that's something the legislature did last year. And what it did was said, you won't be prosecuted for bringing your drugs there and the people testing your drugs won't be prosecuted for testing them. If we didn't have a law like that, all of that could happen. The police could stand outside, arrest you for having drug, drugs on your person uh, and arrest the people that are, that are handling the drugs. So um, that was an initiative. Um, and I give a lot of credit to your Senator. Uh, uh, Senator Hardy uh, worked hard on that piece of legislation um, and was able to help uh, get that through the legislature last year. Just a couple other quick things. Um, we've also introduced uh, legislation that you may have been hearing about it. It's active in the legislature right now uh, around overdose prevention centers. Um, lots of different names for this, but the idea of it, something that's been in place for decades around the world, including in Canada, um, been peer reviewed by over 180 peer reviewed studies. Um, and the one statistic that stands out the most related to overdose pre prevention centers is that in the history of overdose prevention centers, there's never been an overdose death in the center. So um, overdose prevention centers, um, there's legislation pending in the legislature now to set up a pilot program similar to what has been set up in Rhode Island. The state of Minnesota last year funded overdose prevention centers. And um, in New York City, there's two projects that are working actively now without state approval. Um, but that's uh, legislation that's currently debated and being debated and discussed. Can we just, uh, uh, can we just quickly define the overdose prevention center? Yeah, sure. Uh, an overdose prevention center is um, a place, could be a room, a facility, uh, where an individual can go um, they can they bring their own drugs. Um, they can have it tested. Um, they have services available. Um, they have and ultimately you consume the drugs on the location, uh, being monitored by trained professionals to make sure that you're not going to overdose. If there is respiratory issues, um, they can give you naloxone, um, they can give you oxygen. Oftentimes it just takes oxygen as opposed to naloxone. When you're coming out of, when you are take naloxone, we, we have a lot of naloxone in the state and for folks that are going through an overdose and are administered naloxone, it can be a very traumatic experience coming out of, um, of the overdose. And so if the admin, administration of, of oxygen uh, oftentimes it's sufficient to um, bring somebody uh, back into respiratory maintenance. Um, and so it's a safe place where people can both uh, consume safely to make sure that they don't die, but also can um, have more of a, when I say safe place, not just physically safe place, emotionally safe place, intellectually safe place, where people can have discussions with those that are there about things they might want to do differently in their lives, whether it's access a group, whether it's to get hooked up with a recovery center, whether it's to access MAT. Um, you know, the statistics are pretty uh, amazing in terms of the number of people. One study showed that 47% of people uh, who access overdose prevention centers within two years are, uh, there's a 47% increase of the uptake of treatment, for instance, them actually accessing treatment. So it's sort of a place where they can be safe right now. Um, there are no safe places. Uh, the Department of Health has a campaign, never use alone. That's the idea. You never want to use alone because if you use alone, you have the risk of dying alone. And the problem with that is that our law doesn't reflect that. Uh, there is no place to legally uh, not use alone. You can't do it um, safely and legally. So um, this is, uh, these would be places that are uh, staffed and um, accommodated for people to come and consume uh, drugs uh, safely uh, and hopefully get access to the type of services they need when they need them. So, um, and then finally, one of the other initiatives um, 
that, and I'm happy, and this is one that I'd be interested in, in folks' thoughts on. Uh, this is a bill uh, that's been introduced in both uh, the, the House and the Senate. One third of, about one third of the House members have introduced it, and about um, over a third of the Senate. Uh, it's a bill that would um, decriminalize the possession and sharing of drugs. So take the criminality out of the possession of drugs, uh, modeled very much on what Portugal did about 23 years ago. And for those that are interested, you can look at uh, the results of that. But um, is there a number? Um, well, Debbie, I, off the top of my head, uh, H423, uh, I believe. Yeah. Uh, and I forget the Senate uh, version of that. But um, the idea is, yeah, Dave will get it. But the idea is that when um, we take criminality out of it, we can then focus on the things that are actually gonna impact people's lives in a positive way. And not just the individual, but the, but people's families and our community's lives. So the consequences of criminality are significant. Um, so. David, um, maybe, this is, maybe this is even more radical than you. Um, <laughs> I haven't you know, given you all my ideas. It, it, um, <laughs> You know, I'm just thinking that you know we're talking about uh, testing people's drugs, you know, uh, so that they know what they're taking, and um, creating safe places for them to consume their drugs. Um, why are we not talking about creating a safe supply of drugs so that people know what they're getting and aren't getting it through criminal networks? I mean, I think people are. Yeah, I think people are talking about it. Just like, and I think it's an iterative process. I mean, we weren't talking about methadone treatment until we were, and now we're not. Nobody would ever assume to, re to repeal our law to allow for methadone treatment, you know? So I think it takes an evolution of thinking. We have decades of thought that the only solution to drugs is to put people in prison. That's been the base of our policy for the last 50 plus years. And so, but I do think that the conversation about safe supply is happening and it's coming in other countries that are far, far ahead of us uh, in having that conversation. I mean, there are, for instance, um, programs in other countries that are called heroin maintenance programs. So instead of receiving um, MAT, uh, buprenorphine or methadone, you would be receiving Dilaudid, which is synthetic heroin. It's a safe uh you know dose amount that you would receive like you would for methadone that's one example of it um you know and some of it's hard because um i would argue that a lot of the lethality associated with our current drug crisis is a result of the drug war so if you look at op opiates um you know we had opium and there was an effort to prevent that we then had heroin there was an effort to prevent that we now have fentanyl. There's an effort to prevent that. Um, and I think that uh, the lethality charts along the lines of, uh, uh, of the criminalization and the extent to which we are attempting to prevent people from uh, using these substances as, a, as opposed to taking a harm reduction approach, which says, how can we keep people alive as long as possible to then hopefully stabilize, get in a place where they no longer want and need to uh, use drugs. I also just want to add one other plug about, you know, we isolate this conversation to drop about drug policy and make it about drugs. But I think people much smarter than me and experts would say, this is really a conversation that we should be having about housing, about food insecurity, about transportation. I mean, we just heard that Danielle talk about transportation barrier, you know, and, you know, all of the things that about, you know, ACEs, you know, adverse childhood events, the things that lead people to um, become addicted or have substance use disorder, the conversation about those root causes, and then the continuation of people's lives in which they can't access the type of, uh, the type of services that they need because of poverty, because of uh, all trauma and all those things. I think those conversations need to go hand in hand. And um, just one last thing before we um, go to a, a Q&A. Um, you know, so uh, 
in, I think it was 2020, uh, Oregon, the voters of Oregon passed a, a decriminalization referendum. And now, four years later, um, Oregon legislators are repealing that and recriminalizing drug possession. Now, of course, um, a, a pandemic happened. Uh, we saw a spike, you know, in the chart, a post-pandemic spike in, in overdose deaths. Um, you know, Oregon saw the same thing. Um, but um, just politically, like, why do you think, how do you think that backlash could have been avoided? And as we think about moving, you know, decriminalization policies in Vermont, how do we proactively avoid that backlash? Yeah, it's a really good question. This is a hard debate for us, a hard, a hard issue for those of us involved in drug policy. Because um, what happened in Oregon just now with Democratic super, this is a Democratic, like this is the, the Addison County Democrats, yes. Democratic super majorities in Oregon with a Democratic governor just reversed after two years of barely implementing a law. Uh, uh, and what I would think, and as you, you pointed out, for political mm -hmm. reasons, uh, uh, reversed a law that hadn't even been given a chance to take effect. Um, in the Oregon law, just so you know, they redirected $300 million of cannabis funds into harm reduction programs. Those funds didn't even flow for the first year and just barely started to flow after. Um, I think probably the mistakes of Oregon were really more about uh, the implementation and it was easy for folks in Oregon to, and right, you know, right on the streets of Portland and other places, open drug use like we have here in Vermont like they have in Boston, like they have in Washington, D.C., all over this country, we see this as an issue. And it was easy because they had something to blame instead of taking responsibility for the circumstances that led to people having to uh, consume in public. I think what we're doing around overdose prevention centers, I mean, I have my, you know, lefty progressive hat on, but there's an argument to say with an overdose prevention center, even if you don't like drugs, you don't like folks using drugs, you can say, well, at least it's happening there. You know what I mean? So there's something to public drug use, which is unsettling for all of us. Um, they didn't have that as an option in Oregon. Um, and so uh, I thought that was a mistake. And also, I, I don't know, it, it's easy to blame, you know, the law for what happened, but uh, really this was, a, um, this was a political decision more than one based on evidence. When you look at the and a lot of it was related to the overdose deaths in Oregon. Overdose rates in Washington, the neighboring states were higher. They had to decriminalize drugs. No other place in the country who was dealing with these issues had decriminalized drugs, yet the same problems exist. But, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, all right, so we have about uh, 10 minutes, uh, eight minutes before uh, uh, Middlebury Community TV has to switch over to another meeting that they're airing tonight. So I'm going to um, uh, ask the audience to think of some questions they want to ask. Um, but I want to ask Ian, um, how many people do typically go through your program? You know, you can give me like, if you're, over the course of the last year, how many people have gone through the program? Sure. So our kind of stable headcount is somewhere around 20, sometimes a little higher, sometimes a little lower. We definitely saw a low watermark um, several years ago, but have been making a pretty concerted effort to bring up our census. And I, so out of the roughly 20 people that are in the program, how many of those do you expect will graduate versus how many do you expect will you know, end up uh, you know, back out into the traditional program system? <clears throat> I mean, that's going to vary intensely depending on who comes in. And 100% graduation rate means that prosecutors are not sufficiently targeting high-risk, high-need populations. Because if people are actually high-risk, high-need, it's going to be tough, right? The people who sail through, they should be engaged, at least within the criminal justice system we have, in one of the lower level forms of alternative justice. And another thing you mentioned was that um, you have to plead guilty to the underlying charge to enter this program. Um, is it fair to criticize the program? I'm just sure. joking as a lawyer. Uh, is it fair to criticize the program as perhaps coerce, coercing people to plead guilty uh, in order to have this, you know, this carrot 
of, of not going to jail in situations where, you know, perhaps they'd be able to beat the majority. I mean, people are always entitled to have a jury trial, right? That is a fundamental right that every person enjoys in our system. Um, yeah, so if, if they want to try to beat the charges, they're entitled to. Full stop. There's, that's their choice. Um, okay. uh, there's a hand in the back. Uh, so I have a question just with regard to uh, your opinions on long-term solving the problem. What it sounds like to me is that uh, traditional approaches, following the money, looking at the product that's coming in, that that is never going to be to, to solve the problem because when there are those who are addicted, they'll figure out a way to get around that. Would that, um, would, would that be uh, you know, something that you guys all agree with, that we need to deal with the people problem because dealing with it in terms of the more traditional methods just are not going to work? Dave, start with me. Yeah, I mean, yes, I, I would say. And what Oregon did, and they just started to see some of the results of that, they were infusing millions of dollars into housing, into treatment programs, into, uh, you know, job programs, you know, those types of things, really bringing resources to get at the underlying issues as to why people, mental health, I mean, the, the great great issue you raised, is it a mental health issue or a, or a physical drug addiction issue, you know, um, really getting at the systems that are going to help get at the root causes and the, the, the reason that addiction and problematic drug use continues. But the idea that we as humans are going to somehow have a world in which you never consume things that alter us, I think is a false notion. Anything out there? I disagree. Um, so in Vermont, uh, so I'm from Maine and I went to uh, treatment. It was in, it was inpatient for the beginning and then but it was 18 months. Our uh, treatment here, um, so our inpatient treatment for Medicaid uh, eligible people, um, we have two treatment uh, programs and they're two weeks. Uh, so after the two weeks, the Medicaid reimbursement plummets um, so that the programs, sure, people can get extensions. Um, but the program wouldn't be able to stay afloat if they kept everyone there after two weeks. Uh, two weeks is not, um, is a stabilization, um, but that's it here. Uh, and then uh, Addison County has no recovery residents, so we don't have any safe places for people to go after. So we either have to let, ask them to leave our county or they go back to where they were before. Um, so that's the issue, right? We need to put funds into how we give people the support. Um, beyond we'll get the drugs out of your system but then you know go back to the wet homeless shelter or wherever you were staying prior to that cause these issues and, and ian let, let me just kind of like recenter that question um it, it, as a prosecutor um do you feel like there's a need to um do, do you feel that the current balance is okay or do you feel like there's a need to shift the balance in our sort of response from an enforcement response and interdiction response to a uh, addressing the underlying issues. Yeah, so I mean, at least, question, speak, yeah. sure. at least speaking for myself, many of the negative externalities of crimes driven by substance use disorder and the distribution of illicit drugs are the things I worry most about. I'll put that in concrete terms. He has armed robberies, shootings, stabbings, residential burglaries, those are the things that, <clears throat> those are negative externalities associated with the drug trade, and those are the things that I want I want to focus the majority of my efforts on. Uh, I think that within the system of laws we've got, right, like I believe in democracy, right? I believe that the people's representatives enacting laws are something that the executive branch has an obligation to enforce to their best lights, that our enforcement of drug laws, when we are talking just about drug possession, drug use, should be focused on rehabilitation. And I think that's the best I can do in this system. Thank you. Um, I'm just curious how Rutland, uh, Rutland County has managed to get these wraparound services for for the people in the drug uh, the treatment. Treatment court, yeah. And we can't seem to get that here. And, you know, like counseling service, everything, everything that 
the coach and everything that you mentioned seems like so such an important part of what you're doing, and yet it sounds like it's so missing here in Addison County. So I can't talk much about Addison County, despite growing up north and living south of Addison County. Um, I can't talk about Rowan County, though. Uh, one of the judges I shared at the very end, uh, Judge McCaffrey, the courthouse um, now carries his name, um, was the chief trial judge for Vermont for many years. And as he approached his retirement, way back before my chart of overdose deaths began, he thought we could be doing better. Our dockets became more crowded as drugs associate, or crimes associated with drug use proliferated. Uh, so he pushed really hard to uh, to create a treatment court and use you know, his position as a judge to help encourage prosecutors and defense attorneys to come to the table. I would be remiss in saying that treatment courts, they are not, they're not a constitutional court, they're not a statutory court in terms of making people be there. It is all of the stakeholders choosing to be there. And one of the things you said about treatment, uh, pardon me, access to treatment through transportation, jog something that I'm embarrassed I didn't point out. Uh, our local municipality, Rutland City, um, is really bought into this program. You may have heard about Project Vision where community stakeholders come together. They also have police officers assigned to that and not surprisingly the mayors involved. We have a police officer who's assigned to treatment court. You might think, how could a police officer help people struggling in addiction? Won't that be counterproductive? But he has a very clear direction to be engaged in facilitating recovery. So when we have those bed days, right, with far too few days, but we have a bed day for somebody who doesn't have a driver's license, doesn't have a car, and somehow needs to get to residential treatment, they'll drive with them. They'll get an unmarked car and they'll drive with them with the case manager to do a warm handoff to the residential treatment and on the back end. That's a huge commitment in a police department and a state that is struggling with staffing for policing, but it's a commitment because they believe in it. And it's not just that. Both the chief of police and the mayor regularly will come and sit in on the public treatment court sessions to show their support and their belief that people can build a better future. And it's hard to see that level of engagement and buy-in and not feel like you're working together to achieve something. I'll take uh, one last question if there is one. Um, okay. Well, um, yeah, Steve. I did like your slides. You mentioned investigations. Your office does the investigations? Uh, so generally speaking, the police do investigations. We can be involved in some uh, super serious investigations where there are inquest subpoenas search warrants, non-testimonial orders, but generally speaking, the police do the investigation upon completion of the motivation for that question was how well does that how well does that mesh with your treatment stuff? So. Yeah, the police by and large in ninety nine point nine nine percent of investigations. And I imagine I can get all the records to find out exactly what they do in doing that. So what the police are doing in investigating crime? You can request your local police departments, the Rutland City Police Department, you can make public records requests to them for all that stuff. So right. un unfortunately, uh, that brings us to the end of our allotted time on uh, MCTV. So oh. I want to, uh, first of all, thank uh, our panelists, uh, Ian, Danielle, David, for coming uh, tonight. This was, uh, I thought, super educational. Uh, and I'd like to thank Middlebury Community Television for helping with our tech setup and for airing this on their channel. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming.